Um, well, we've got a really fun panel today, and I want to introduce you to our panelists. Starting down at the end, we have Armand Serrano. Armand has worked on Zootopia, Big Hero 6, Surf's Up, and 100 other Disney and Sony movies. Um, we can give him a little round of applause. Oh, yeah. Hot room, hot room. Um, next to him is Mr. Peter Hahn, the drawing wizard. Um, if you guys have ever seen Peter Hahn do a demo, you know it is one of the most exciting things in this space. Um, Peter is a teacher at Art Center. He's also at Brainstorm School. And he has just finished his own IP called The Blacksmith, which I have not gotten to see yet, but I'm hoping he's going to give me a glimpse after this. Uh, Peter Hahn, ladies and gentlemen. The, the drawing wizard. The drawing wizard. And then next to him, we have Ben Morrow. Ben has done something very amazing. He has spent years traveling the world whilst being an artist. Something very hard to do. He's worked at, at um, many of the top studios. He's now at 343 working on Halo. He's worked on Valerian. He worked on Elysium. He's worked on some super cool stuff. Very happy to have Ben Morrow here. And sitting next to Ben, we have Tian Li, Ben's partner in crime. They have traveled the world together. Talk to them about that, because that is amazing. Tian has worked on Call of Duty, Black Ops, the last two. Um, she also worked on Figureheads and Vainglory. Um, we're very happy to have Tian here, too. Please, a nice warm round. You guys are doing great. You guys are doing great. Um, and next to Tian is Max Berman. Um, Max has been an art director and a matte painter for the last decade. He's worked on Halo and Far Cry. He painted the wall in Game of Thrones. He art directed the opening titles of Westworld. Um, he is also my co-founder in Kibash 3D and a wonderful human being. So please, give it up for Max Berman. Okay. So we are going to talk a little bit about networking. Um, and could we, Tian, could you take us, take us into this? Um, when you think of networking, I feel like it can get a, a negative connotation, but I think you have a really great take on this. What do, yeah, how do you feel about I just networking? Thought networking is more about, I just thought networking is more about making friends. I don't really like to call it networking. I just, whenever I see strangers, I'm just like, hey, how are you? Uh, what's going on? Let's, you know, like, I don't feel like I have to be taking it in a very business di direction. I just have to say hi and be friendly and, you know, you never know who this person is and just be friends. Who mm -hmm. cares? Yeah. I love that. I feel like it's so, it's so often that we talk about networking as, as something to do with business and we have to have something to achieve. Mm -hmm. But yet in our business, it's so much about can we, do we like the person? Yeah, do we want exactly. to spend hours and hours and days and weeks mm -hmm. and years on a singular project? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I just feel like you don't have to, I, I mean, I don't even know who this person is. I don't have to, I don't have to have a business relationship with this person, but if we can be friends, maybe you never know some opportunity might come up or it might not, and you just have a new friend. Mm -hmm. So that's how I approach it. Ben, in your world travels, whilst working on all these projects, did you find that you were able to make connections with people on the road? Sure, I, I also think, even starting out, like all the people I'm in touch with, like from school and stuff, like they're now the people running the companies. And if I just didn't talk to anyone or um, was maybe too introspective and was just closed off, I wouldn't have had, like now when I catch up with people, it's like, there's just a lot of uh, people go out in the world and everyone's doing really great things and just you know, like being friends with everyone. And, mm. You just don't know where everyone's going to go and be nice to everyone and right. keep in touch with everyone. You, you bring up a good point about school, which I forgot to ask you all. How many of you all are students? OK, cool. And how many of you all are in the industry for less than five years? Nice, nice. And so the rest of you all design the Iron Man suits? <laughs> got it, got it, cool. OK, um, so Peter, being a teacher yourself, um, what do you tell your students as they are on their way out of school, getting ready to step into the world and try to find their first job? Finding their first job? Yeah. You're not going to find that first job that you want. You're not going to get it. You might think, I want to work for this company. I've built my portfolio for that. I'm sorry, it's not going to happen. Maybe for a small percentage of you, and you're seeing that. You're saying, I want that, but all of you are moving that same direction. I didn't get the first job I wanted. You know where I wanted to work? It was Pixar. I had all my portfolio, I had all the connections. Didn't happen. 
I had to find that side door, that side step. And I ended up working in a field that I actually didn't think I really would. I wanted to do animation, but I worked in games, concept art. Opportunity popped up, they found me. They contacted me and said, hey, we want you to come in and design vehicles. You can sketch really well. Ah, all right, I'll give it a try, because I need a job. It's been six months since I graduated. I need to work, <laughs> I'm paying my loans. But I didn't get the first job I wanted. And you're not gonna get it, unfortunately. But if you do, congratulations, you made it. But if you don't, now what are you gonna do, right? Networking is the answer to that part. Tell us more about that. Well, in terms of that part of networking, it's the long lasting community, not about right now making friends, but investing in people. Because it's the person that's right next to you that's the most important thing, not behind this table. Because if you talk to the people out there at Lightbox, you're trying to make connections with the pros, you got 20 years in between those two people. But talk to the person right next to you. You should be doing that right now. Did you even get a chance to say, right the person next to you, introduce yourself? Did you even do this? You sat down, you're looking at us. You should be looking at each other, okay? That's your That's network. True. That's true. That's so true. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah. I think that there couldn't be a more important point that Peter just made is, is put yourself out there. And as, as artists, I'm sure, it doesn't always feel the most natural thing to do. We spend a lot of time alone, don't we? And we spend a lot of time working. And when you get into an environment like this, this is so highly targeted for your people. Everyone around you on this side of the table, there and outside the door are just like you. And they care as much as you do about what you're doing. And so to put yourself out there as much as you possibly can and to have the courage to introduce yourself to someone, look them in the eye and hear their name and remember it. How many people remember the name of someone they just met? Uh, we'll talk about that. We'll talk about that. We'll talk about that. Uh, so let's, let's keep going. Ar Arman, can you talk a little bit about how you, how you got into the industry um, and in the beginning for you, what was it like as you started to build your network? So how long do we have? <laughs> now, <clears throat> I, I grew up in Manila, so I, I was from the other side, and uh, I was a product of um, outsourcing. So without outsourcing, they wouldn't be able to get me into a studio. So uh, the U.S. studios, they started building up their outsourcing um, animation studios in Manila in the late 80s. I was in, in, in college then. I always wanted to go to anime. I, I always wanted to draw, but I never looked at it as a real job, just like what my dad said um, in Asia, you know, uh, you got to be a doctor or a nurse or what. So anyway, I want to be a, an artist and I didn't go. I, he said, you know, get a real job, you know, find a real profession. Find a, so uh, I ended up um, taking uh, civil engineering in college. And I didn't know there's so much math on it, but I finished it, uh, finished it. Then when I finished, I heard about the animation studio. I said, that sounds cool. I draw, I've been drawing all my life. So I, I, I applied. I got into um, Hanna-Barbera uh, in Manila. And through that, again, in, in terms of networking, it's like, I like what the, the guys were saying, especially Chen was saying about friendship. It's not about business always. Like, what you, I mean, you guys talk to each other, and it's all about business. But eventually, there would be, you don't have to be, you don't have to hug them always, but it becomes more like, you know, you have a, a good uh, relationship, you know, a friendly relationship with the person. And that's how I got to know a lot of people from the union coming over to Manila. They would supervise the animation that we're working with. So before you know it, after two or three years in the animation, I know a lot of people in the union in LA. So long, to make the long story short, they had me, hey, why don't you try to go to the US? Here's my brother, um, Paul Felix, call him. He's art directing gargoyles at Disney. Two o'clock in the morning, because of that relationship I had with his brother, he's now it's like, call my brother. <laughs> so I called his brother at two o'clock in the morning. And um, so he told me about Visa and all this stuff, and I, I thought I wasn't ready. So, but I, I gave me some confidence to send 30 uh, application letters to 30 different studios in LA. And I said, the first one to bite, that's it. I'm in LA. <laughs> There's one in that bit. <laughs> so I work in a game studio in the CD-ROM games. cd -ROM. I don't know if you guys know what cd -ROM was. Uh, it's a game <laughs> studio um, in Glendale. They, they, yeah, they relocated me, my wife, and our oldest daughter, and my wife was pregnant at the time. So, but as soon as I got in, I didn't stop there. I started, I went to um, Associates in Art, which, is, uh, the pre which was the predecessor of Union Studios, and I took a class. I, wanna, I don't want to go back to school because it's, it's, it's expensive and I don't have time. So I applied to this school, 
um, night classes. And lo and behold, my teacher was Paul Felix <laughs> and Jim Schlenker. And that paved the way. I, I didn't sleep for 13 weeks because I was building my portfolio. I was in class with Steven Silver and Paul Wee. <laughs> so I, I'm glad I was good to them, networking <laughs> <laughs> at that time. And, and yeah, so it, I mean, Paul has, I, I've worked with Paul. I got hired at Disney after, after 13 weeks. And I kept that relationship. I went to Disney, I left Disney, and Paul was the key person also why I went back to Disney the second time around. Um, so it's because all about that relationship uh, with people that you know in the industry. So mm. that's why I'm here. Max, you and I are kind of a shining example of this. Um, can you talk a little bit about how we met and how long it took for us to start working together? Why, well, sure, Max. <laughs> <laughs> no, you tell it this. Uh, uh, <laughs> no, uh, I had a mutual friend who called me uh, about uh, eight years ago to VFX supervise a commercial, and I showed up on set, and Banks was directing it and producing it. And I remember having such a good time on set with this guy, and we became real good friends and started hanging out after that shoot. And without any idea of working together again, just we hit it off. And went our own paths, you know, a lot of things happened of working on projects, getting busy, hadn't seen each other in you know, six years. And he calls me up one day and says, hey, I miss hanging out with you. I don't know what you've been up to, but I would love to see you again. Uh, let's go to a Lakers game. And uh, that day, you know, I don't know, two hours later, we're like, man, we have the same mentality. We're in the same mental space. We should, uh, we should start a business. What's the business going to do? No fucking clue. <laughs> <laughs> and and that, was, that was, you know, seven years of being friends and yeah. of, of thinking that we had the, the same mindset and we saw the world changing in the same way. Yeah, and that friendship wasn't you know, because we were trying to do work together or help each other out in a professional sense. It was just, we genuinely like each other. We have the same philosophy and mentality. And, and then years later realized, hey, that's actually a, a pretty good recipe to start a company. Yeah. Peter, have you spent time, I know you've, you've taught at a lot of places, have you spent time um, working with someone early on and then years later gotten to, to work with them again? Um. Working together, you mean as students or on a professional? Sure, yeah, students even better. Uh, yeah, I mean, of course, a lot of my friends that are in the industry are all friends from like the Art Center Times college years, you know, and, and then in this very room, there's people here that I worked together with as students, being in the bunker, you know, of Art Center as it is, and going through, you know, the terror and, <laughs> uh, you know, the frightening experience of the instructors and the stress of the amount of time we're investing into this. Um, and, you know, that experience of not just only working on the projects we're developing, but spending time socializing, building this common ground uh, and, and growing together, you know, always constantly competing and then also showing each other work and elevating others, uh, which then migrates into work into the future. Um, and I will call this guy out right here in the front, it's Izzy Madrano, uh, you know, close friend of mine. I've known him since I was 14. This guy right over here. Wow. Known him since I was in high school. I went to ninth grade in Oregon, uh, up in Portland. And he was the first guy I met. He was in 10th grade, a year older than I was. He took me under his, uh, under his wing. And um, since then, we've spent all of our time through high school to art center, to working in the studios, and eventually even working together on just IPs and projects, writing and just developing visuals. Mm -hmm. um, but again, we're close friends, very, very close friends. And, and I respect the things that he does. And during the time, I respected what he also did then, too. Uh, and of course, not just him, but many other people in that experience. So. Like I said earlier, it was that investment of the community of a long-term aspect where it's like not getting the immediate return of a friendship, but you just care about the person, you're gonna invest yourself into it, and who knows might happen because 10 years from now, you don't know where they'll be. Mm -hmm. So the people I'm working with or have worked with, again, are the leaders of the industry now. I might not be. Maybe I work a lot more in education, but those guys, man, they're invested in all the studios and working on massive projects. And I may never actually get to work on that stuff, but I love seeing them be successful. I love seeing them excel. And I learn from them still at this point. So how is that still not learning and working at the same time? If I don't actually get to touch those things, I can see their stresses, their experiences, their failures as also. So it's, it's a community growth of education as you work with those people continually, but you have to make the effort to reach out to them too. You can't wait and sit for something to happen or wait for them to reach out to you. 
You know, that's the hard part about keeping friends is that you have to be proactive of constantly reaching out to them, saying, how are you doing? What are you working on, right? Is this something that we can work together with? Do you make a point to do that? Oh, absolutely. How, yeah. how do you do that? And that's something that you, me and Izzy will do. We'll work on something, I'll send them stuff. Hey, what do you think? Izzy will send me a treatment, I'll write it. If we don't give each other specific detailed thoughts, if we see each other one year, we just have a couple of conversations. Hey, did you see this? What did you think of that, right? And not looking for um, problem solving or this really heavy, intense conversation. It's just casual talk sometimes. And those casual talks takes the pressure off of like you trying to create something because you spent a year focusing on it. You can kind of back off a little bit, look at it from a distance together with somebody, and you start to see the things you didn't notice because you had tunnel vision, right? So that's a huge part of how I'm continuing to really build that. Yeah, I love yeah. that. Ben, how do you, how do you balance or how, how do you feel some of the key differences are in your relationships as you were on the road to now being at a studio? Well, I think back to what you said, like you gotta put yourself out there. Um, most of us starting out, we just wanna practice and be good enough to get a job. But until you promote yourself and put yourself out there, like people can't buy a product they don't know exists. Mm -hmm. So by you putting yourself out there is you advertising that you exist, this is what you do. And I feel like it's very important, even though it does take up quite a bit of time, but getting to meet people one-on-one -on -one really is better than just an email. And I mean, emails and things are fine, but meeting someone one-on-one -on -one and again, finding common interests and, and a lot of that has led to jobs and friendships. And uh, a lot of people I've met on the road, like say one of my friends, Mike Hill now is a good friend. Um, I met him in Berlin he was trying to, he's kind of working in house and he was wanting to break out and become um, more independent. And I was kind of doing it that, that at the time and he kind of picked my brain and I was just like, well, this is how I'm doing it. This is what I'm doing. And now he's kind of, doing the same thing and going into new areas that I never went into and now he's helping me. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, just saying how being on the road and meeting people one on one is really helpful. Um, a lot of people I've met are really good friends now and um, maybe at the time, like say one of my friends in Berlin, Mike Hill, he was kind of working in studios and was kind of wanting to branch out and be more independent like I was and I just basically told him everything I was doing and this is how I did things and this is what I was doing and kind of making it up as I go, but it really helped him and now he's kind of doing the same. And from his standpoint, I've kind of slowed down and I want to work on my own projects, but he's kind of going so many different directions that I never had gone into. And now he's, again, it's kind of that energy I put out helped him and he's taking it in a totally new direction that I never went to and taking it much further. And now he's helping me out and a lot of things like that where it's just like, I'm not, I could have been like, well, it's gonna cost $500 to talk. I mean, you know, it's just mm -hmm. like, I just wanna help people because that positive energy goes out there and comes back to you in ways you can never understand or experience and can't plan for. In the name of that, you made a video series on YouTube talking mm -hmm. about your experiences and sure. how yeah. someone can do that. How can they find that? Uh, just on YouTube, it's, I think it's just business, art, life. Uh, and a couple little tutorials and things. I haven't done much of it lately, but um, I definitely plan to do more in the future. Just again, just it's all a big community, and I feel like anything we can do to help and put out this information out there, and you never know where it's going to go. You never know who's going to see it and how it's going to come back to you. And um, putting kind of these positive efforts out into the world, I feel maybe if it doesn't, you don't see it come back to you immediately, but things find a way to to come back to you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Tian, would you say that the games industry in particular is very close knit? That it's it's consistently looking to to help it help each other out and give back. Do you feel that? I feel so. I feel so. But also, I have a little story that I can tell too. So, a couple of years ago, I find this girl. Um, I don't even know where I found her, but she was doing this really cute art. And I really liked her art, and I saw that she's from the same hometown with me, but I've never met her in person before. And then, so I just reached out, because I'm shameless. So I was just like, hey, I really like your art, I love it. Uh, yeah, I saw that you're from my hometown too, which is Chengdu, China. I was like, hey, like, uh, can we be friends? <laughs> that's, that's, that's all I do, right? So, um, and she reached back to me, she's like, oh, I also love your work. Oh my God, we're from the same hometown. Let's be friends. And then and we became friends. <laughs> and then it was originally just internet chatting. And then gradually, like, I think when I visited States, I 
Yeah, I was actually traveling with him. So it was like the first time or the second time I come to the States and we meet up. And then we had coffee and she brought out her dog. It was really cute. <laughs> and then, yeah, so I get to know her. And then uh, several weeks ago, um, her husband is actually working in an independent, independent game studio, like their startup. Um, and uh, I saw the projects that they're working on and they're hiring new people. I'm like, hey, your game looks super cool. Can I work on that? They're like, okay, great. But, you know, I still did an art test and stuff. But still, it's like because they already know me and I already know them as friends. So it's just like friends working together. It's, do this together. Let's make something together. So that was that was really cool. I thought it's a cool story to share. <laughs> That's how I network. I'm just like, hey, I really like your work. Do you want to be friends? Let's be friends. <laughs> <laughs> um, speaking of of reaching out on the internet, Armand, let's let's yeah. talk a little bit about social media and some of the do's and don'ts mm -hmm. um, for artists reaching out for mentorship or for jobs. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's interesting, you know, me being the older, I'm the oldest in the group. I have kids <laughs> on this side. You know, being older, I mean, I've seen, I've seen it, it, it grow from what it was before when everything was just blogging, then it grew into social networking. And it was great. I mean, you can use it both ways for something bad or something good. But but there's always, um, there's always have to have a boundary in everything that we do. In social media nowadays, it's almost like you can say whatever you want. That's your, that's your, that's your spot. You can do whatever you want with it, right? That's, that's everyone's uh, mentality on social media. But once you start networking, you know, you, and, and you're happy, you get connected with a professional that you admire. So you can follow them, you, you get to chat with them, you get to ask questions from them. So you get to do whatever. You call them, hey, you know, hey, dude, you know, can you can ask you a question? Of course. So we answer back and everything. But there has to be a boundary. Once, if you're just asking um, casual questions about the artwork that they posted, that's totally fine. But once you cross the line, there has to be a boundary. What once you cross, hey, can I show you my portfolio because there's a job opening in your studio or something like that. Now you're crossing the boundary of professionalism. Now you, it's about work. So you have to, uh, I think people, has to have, uh, people have to know what that boundary is. And I think there's a per, it's a perfect example. Uh, a friend of mine, he's a professional and he wanted to send a portfolio. Don't just send your portfolio, by the way. I hated that. It's almost like if you send a portfolio, it's like, it's my obligation to look at it. Ask, ask first. It's just a matter of asking, can I send, can I show you my portfolio? Uh, and we will answer, you know, I don't have time. Maybe you send it next week or that. But whatever it is, ask permission. When the person said yes, don't call them dude. Hey, dude, can I ask, hey, dude, can I send you my portfolio? It's like, first, I mean, you're not, because you crossed the boundary, so call them by their first name. Hey, Peter, can I ask you? Even if they could call him dude for the, you know, before, but once you, once you start talking about work, then be professional about it. And it, it, it's not about him getting mad at you. No, it's about you're, you're showing who you are, too, uh, when you want to be a professional. So, so yeah, I think, um, yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's the one that's on top of my head that we talked about. It's, it's don't be too casual when you start crossing the boundary of work. Yeah. One thing I, I want to point out, Peter, you're drawing yeah. right now, right? And that's you. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, the, the, f oh my God. <laughs> the, the first time uh, we met Peter, we were at, we were at a big dinner and I, I noticed I, I came over to your table and you were sitting there and you had drawn, you drawn something equally as amazing. I think it's, it's such a testament to just your sheer passion that you are always, always, always drawing. A hundred percent. Yes. I mean, you, you, you talked about this a lot in your, in your talks about, sure. about just the sheer amount of time and passion you put into it. I know this is yeah. a slight derailing, but you're, you're doing it in front of us. So can you just talk a little bit about that? In terms of the passion and yeah. the investment and of the, something? Just the amount of time you put into oh, I mean, understanding it's, it's lines. It's an endless thing. And it's not work at this point. It's, it's not even a habit either. It's, it's who I am at the core, you know, down to the very core. Because then, again, for me at this point, it hasn't been about a career, the next job, or the amount of money I'm going to make from it. It's because I can't stop thinking about it. You know, it's like it's, uh, if I don't draw, I'm literally shaking, I'm jittering. You know, it's a, it's gotten to that point where I don't have to think about it. It, it just happens. Mm. Um, it, the world around me, the things people hear, what they worked on, what do you guys look like, the people out there is a constant influx of just information, and my brain is constantly on too. 
So I'm always observing and absorbing that information. Now, some of the stuff I may never use, but the idea is that this is something that puts me in a mindset where I'm completely receptive to it. So you might think, oh, you're drawing, you must not be paying attention. Completely the opposite. I hear every single word, I hear every single motion, I see every single person. So I'm very, very on right now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, and, and back, back to a bit more of the, the topic at hand. Yeah. How has social media, you are, you are very prolific on social media, how has that helped your, how has that helped your career and, and get, made it so that you can be doing your sheer passion? Well, okay, so I have an entire lecture on social media, actually. So mm -hmm. when I teach, I have an hour-long talk on, actually goes longer than that, too. And I actually explain it in a complete chronological order from 2008 to now, present. And it shows you the things and products that I've made over the many number of years to have an understanding of the analogy of developing a project or a book and how that worked for me in social media. Mm. Now this only worked for me at the moment and that's not to say that it can't work for someone else, but I wanna give the example of this is the path that I took to get from point A to point B. I feel like there's not enough artists that explain how they actually use social media. They can tell you how they feel about it. They can tell you the warning signs of it. But what were the actual steps that you took to get to the point you are now, right? Some of them may not be able to do that verbally to communicate it. But for me, I can actually give you the analogy right down here right now. It actually happens to shows like this. And the brief explanation is that in 2008 was the first experience at the show, Comic-Con in San Diego. I was given the opportunity. I made a network with my art director at Bottle Rocket Studio in San Diego. And he said, I have a table. Artist Sally, do you want it? I've never done a table before. I walked San Diego Comic Con, I thought it was great. But you know what, why not, it's free. I might as well do it, I'm not doing anything else. I have a nine to five job, I go home, I just sit there, watch a movie, draw a little bit, and I go to sleep. Next day I do the same thing over again. So I decided, you know what, I'll do this table. I made a sketchbook, because I said, you know what, what do people sell? Many little sketchbooks, I produced it. A week before I finished it, put it out there. I had the sketchbook on my left hand side, made 70 of those books. On the right hand side were original work. And the center was something to draw on. People came up, picked up the book, and said, oh, that's kind of cool, and they put it back down. Walked over to my right-hand side and picked up this original work and said, this is amazing, can I buy this? And said, no, this is for display. <laughs> for five days straight, people kept coming up and picked up that book and said, that's okay. And they came up over here and said, I want to buy this. And I had to say, no, this is not for sale, this is for display. <laughs> you know what I did the year after? I made a book of that content. They came back the year after. That's what happens in these shows, right? You guys come back. And they picked up that work and said, I remember this from last year. They didn't remember my face, but they remember that work. And so the year after that, I built it again. I had another content in a book of that same project. Four years straight, I made book after book of that same content. So now I'm building a brand. I'm building a reputation, right? And at that point, I realized, well, shoot, if I'm doing social media on Instagram, this is something here. If I put something on, post, on, on Instagram and I put it up, let's say, four or five images, most of them might got, not get a response, maybe not get a comment but I'm looking for very specific responses. Not, what kind of pen are you using? Oh, this is really cool stuff, man. You know, I like how you draw. I'm looking for, why are you making it? How can I get this? Are you making a book? This is a cool story. I want to buy this. So now I have a product that I can make. So I'm looking for feedback and data. So all the posts I put on social media have tests and thoughts and comments, and I'm getting information. And as soon as something gets locked in, it's like, oh man, you gotta make something of it. I consistently post for months on that one thing. And then people say, you gotta make a book. I make a book. So when I start something, I finish it. You gotta produce it, right? So that continues to build, and now people have a reason to follow you for something, right? Mm. Not just because your art looks cool, but because they can follow you in the development and growth that they can use something for themselves. So that's how you social media. <laughs> Love that, man. And, yeah. and you've just now put out The Blacksmith. Yes, just finished it. Um, talk a little bit just about the, took what the one year is. to produce. I created the concept in 2014. That character was born on Instagram through feedback from other people. Uh, people said, make a comic. And I said, oh, I don't know how to do comics. I've never done it before. And so in 2017, I'll just make a comic because I can't make a show and a movie. So I might as well do print. I wrote, did the art, designed it, uh, printed it, distributed everything myself. I don't know how to write very well, okay? I asked friends for help too. I said, what do you think about this? And everyone I asked, they said, do it yourself. You can hire someone to write it for you, but you know what? They're not gonna be as passionate or as invested as you are. So, okay, maybe it's not very good, but you'll learn. You'll do another book. You'll get better at the each and next one. And that's where then, like I said, you have to start and then finish something. And as you finish it, you can learn, but you gotta keep going. Get to the next one, right? It's not a finish line. It's always a continual race that goes on afterwards. Mm. I love that. Max, you, you say something similar to that quite often you're, you're always looking for how to improve. 
um, why is it that you know having a career like you've had and having you know climbed the mountain of studio movies and games why is it that you're still learning why is why does that push you every day mm -hmm. that's a tough question tough ones today but why to always <laughs> improve <laughs> yeah what what is it what is it about that what what's about not being satisfied that that um that drives you uh, I think ambition is a horrible, horrible curse uh, and a beautiful gift, but that's the curse of ambition. Um, I admire people who have satisfaction. I think that's an amazing thing, and it's, it's not a bad thing if you're satisfied with where you're at. That's just not me. And some people have that hunger and that fire, and nothing's ever going to be enough, and it's just as much of a curse as it is a gift. Um, but I do think a commitment to personal growth and being better every day I don't know. For me, that that's that's fulfilling, and it's especially fulfilling um, to see other people around you do the same thing and to watch other people grow. Um, You're very meticulous in how you do that and how you analyze situations after the fact and how you want to approach them. Can you talk just a little bit about where that comes from and and what that feels like for you? Yeah, luckily I've uh, I've had the chance to screw up in just about every way in my career. Um, <laughs> But, uh, but I think it's because I, I move a million miles a minute, and when you're going to do that, you're going to crash a lot. But I think that each time I failed in some way, I refused to move forward until I got the lesson. And it's, if I can learn this and never make this mistake again, I'm fine with making any mistake as long as I don't make the same one twice. And I think that's that commitment to personal growth. And if you go about it that way, you're going to you aren't going to make the same mistake twice and those mistakes will be worth it and those failures will lead to successes and you'll be able to accomplish whatever you set your sights on and you might have to go down a few bad roads every once in a while and turn around and learn a lesson but i think if you just keep going with that amount of fire then you're going to get there there's a line i love you never lose you either win or learn mm. i think that's that's right at the core of this um more towards uh where we were where we were headed um People are, are constantly reaching out to you um, who want jobs or want mentorship or want portfolio reviews. What are some of the, the successful ways people have done that? And what are some of the not so successful ways people have done that? Mm. Yeah, I've dealt with this a lot. Um, I believe in the mentorship system. I think, uh, I think it's the responsibility of anyone who's accomplished anything in their career to take an apprentice and multiple apprentices. Uh, I was fortunate enough to be an apprentice to an old school uh, oil and glass map painter. Um, I was his third apprentice, and I think it's just something that I believe in. Um, the issue is so many people want a mentor and aren't willing to put in the work. So I've had so many people reach out to me and say, hey, can you mentor me? Can you mentor me? Uh, can I be your next apprentice? And I say, great, I want you to send me a new map painting every day for the next 10 weeks. And if there goes a week where you don't send a map painting, you're not even in consideration. And I'm not going to critique them along the way, but mind you, like this is your job to do the work. And if you're willing to put in the work, I'm willing to put in the work. How many people do you think have ever done this? I've probably gotten hit up by hundreds of artists to be an apprentice. Not one has ever done 10 paintings in a row. Not one. And you go, well, if you're not willing to do that, you're asking to apprentice as a painter and you're not willing to do 10 paintings, why would I spend any amount of time training you? So I think when it comes to the apprenticeship system, the mentorship system, how to ask for help, be willing to put in the work. And if you're not willing to put in the work, you're not ready for it. Can I add to that also? Yeah, I actually really agree with Max uh, in terms of the whole mentorship program thing. It's a huge part of what's trending right now. Kids are looking for this mentorship label. Uh, I mean, my personal thoughts and feelings on the label of mentorship is actually very, very strong because my personal experience also was derived from very strong mentors all the way back from like high school through art center and two-year colleges and whatever after. Uh, and they left lasting impressions. And the students that come up to me asking for mentorship, I actually say no most of the times. And it's because they're looking for this teacher to student relationship. But I don't really believe that mentorships are really even that either. It's deeper than that. So I agree, yes, the student has to invest and do the work to show that they're fully serious about doing it. Um, and if they're not, then obviously you don't accept it.
but I also do feel that it's a very personal thing too. You can't just ask someone to be a mentor. It just doesn't really work that way for me. I have to connect to that person also too. The mentors that I got, they made the choice to invest their energy in me because maybe they saw something. But we became friends, we became very close. Norm Sherman was my mentor at Art Center and he left an extremely lasting impression, not just on technical, but being a human being. So I learned a lot from him just being a man. So that aspect of it is also connected tightly, tightly to my personal experience of growing up as a child. Losing my own father at 10, he was a person that kind of took it over. So when he died in 2010 as well, those were the lasting things like, I have to continue this myself. And I will look for someone I can apprentice, but it's not just because, yeah, they're gonna do the work, but I'm gonna really connect to that individual and I'm gonna invest as much as I can because they're gonna be more than just a student. They're gonna be a lifelong friend also too. So I wanna find that to invest into. Yeah, can I ride along yeah, yeah, the mentorship? <laughs> Mine is a bit different because when I teach, I teach mentorship class on at CGMA, which is an online class. So it's you have to pay to be a men, to be uh, my uh, student, so I can mentor you. And in that one, so it's 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 so sad when the kid would pay eight hundred, nine hundred dollars to invest ten hours of their life. So same thing, I'm so ready every time the class starts and I have 12 students always per term and half of them, on the, the, they were so excited. The first four weeks, they deliver. Then suddenly something happens and they flake off and things. And it's so hard because I, I invested already so much of my time and they paid too. And in my mind, it's your loss. But of course, the, the, the relationship that was built already in the time and, and the preparation on my end too, is to invest in them. And what I found out through, I've been teaching at CGMA for the past five years, but the mentorship has been, I've been doing it for the past almost three years. And the ones that actually made it in the business, Lip Comarello is the director now at Netflix, uh, art director. A lot of them, oh, I went to MPC. And if I look back on those lists, these are the ones who actually sacrificed their time to do the homework, however, however hard or difficult that may be. And, and I told them, you have to spend time, find time to do the work on this mentorship. I don't care if you're a student. I don't care if you're working. Once you signed up, you signed up. I'm also working. So I, I have to treat it as work above my work you know so if i go home i i deal with my family i have then i do the mentorship in the evening that's what i expect from you so you have to treat it as work too um oh then at the end of the mentorship they open it for students to if they have anything to suggest you know what can be improved i get complaints <laughs> he keeps asking me to change my perspective <laughs> You can't draw perspective. That's why I keep asking. No, and it's interesting. The people who, who and I know those people. I mean, the people who, who complain are the ones who actually didn't make it, sadly. Mm -hmm. So there's that opportunity, but it lost. But you're right. I mean, all these people that, that finished actually fully my mentorship, they became friends of mine. Until now, we're always friends. They're always connected. So. Ben, did you have a mentor? I'm not sure if it was anything that, like super formal like that, but Scott Robertson, especially uh, at Art Center, I took, I took, <laughs> I took a lot of his. I basically came to Art Center because I wanted to learn from someone like Scott and Neville Page and these guys who, not, like when I started, all this information was kind of locked behind a bunch of closed doors, and when I saw what they were doing, it just looked like magic, and I was like, I don't feel like I'm smart enough to even learn that stuff, and coming down and taking like his perspective and form classes at Art Center, it's just like someone lifted a magic curtain. And I was like, oh, that's how you do it. Like, I, I can learn it. And I did really well in his classes. And he just kind of, again, like, like Peter said, you kind of make a connection and you just feel like you're kind of have the same values and think the same way. And he invited me to do books and things over the summers when everyone was taking a break or something. and. Um, still just still very good friends with him and um a lot of things like that like don't look at things as very short term like i'm just gonna learn this and i'm out of here like everyone in your life you're probably gonna see them 10 20 years down like these are people in the world and these connections last forever and mm -hmm. i mean armand was one of my first art directors at my first internship 
at Sony Pictures, you know? Like, I was about to jump in and I was like, I remember. <laughs> <laughs> so like all these people, like we, you know, Peter in school and like all these people are, you know, it's not like this isolated experience that you never see mm -hmm. again. Like all these people are here forever. And, it, um, forever? It, yeah. it's, a, it's a relationship business, right? Yeah. It's a long, it's a long term thing. We were at so now that you remind me, yeah, now I remind I remember. We were at Sony and he was our intern. So there's this kid who got in and it was so good. He's like blowing us all the way. I was just starting to do Photoshop. He's like exponentially so amazing in Photoshop. I was asking him questions about Photoshop. Then I remember Paul saying, asking you, uh, do you need to go back to Art Center? <laughs> we can just work here, you know? We're, we're gonna hire you. And I said, my, I think he said, my dad's gonna kill me. I gotta go back to school. <laughs> so he went back to school, but because Ben was so good with when, how he performed uh, at Sony, when he graduated, Paul Lassane recommended him to Wela, and he worked in Wela for some time, right? So that- like four years, yeah. For four years, so. But also with that, like, it doesn't happen like that. Like even with Paul, a recommendation mm -hmm. from a great artist, uh, it still took about a year of persistence on my part of, like I was in touch with Richard, who was the owner mm -hmm. of Weta, and they liked my work, but it was like, ah, oh, I don't know if we have mm -hmm. any free space. And so similar to my mentality of working with you guys was like, I always just want to do my best work right. and I want to improve and I want to learn as much as I can. And so every month I would just send an update email and say like, oh, hey, here's some new work. And each time I made sure it was much better than the last. And each time I was like, oh, thank you. This is beautiful. But you know, we still don't really have any work. And I would just kind of, again, not be persistent without being annoying. Yeah. And, <laughs> Maybe uh, and showing, but, but, but after it was about the 11, 12 month yeah. mark where it was just like, this is amazing. Like we actually have work for you now. Like, are you ready to come? And I was like, yeah, yeah let's do it. But again, even with like, the right skill set, the right job, and the client wanting me to work with them, the timing just didn't work. Right. But I still really wanted that experience, so I was putting the time and had the persistence to say, I really want this thing, I'm gonna keep working at it. Yeah. And eventually the kind of timing and skills and right. whatever worked out, and I just went for it. Great. So fun thinking about how relationships can form over time and what you can do together with people and these, these kind of events are, are such a great example of that you know this this event in particular bobby's put together the most amazing lineup yeah. that's ever existed and you saw it last night of just old friends you know you saw yeah. decades yeah, yeah. of relationships playing out and people so happy to see one another and and to enjoy in each other's success and you know, what does that um what does that what does that mean for you to be part of something like this I think too, it's like, like you're saying, keeping in touch with people, but not like when you get in touch with someone or, or network, but you're so transparent about like, I'm only talking to you because I want a job uh -huh. from you. It's very easily apparent and it kind of is a big put off. Like I have so many friends who are working on jobs that personally I'm not interested in, but I love watching them. I love the work they do, but personally it's just not my cup of tea but i'm so happy for them and i keep in touch just like oh the movie turned out great you guys did mm -hmm. such great work and i have no interest of ever working there but i just appreciate the work they do and i let them know and yeah it just it's just a, f a friendly thing to do mm -hmm. yeah. but there's no ulterior motive like i don't it, there's no way i'd be interested in wanting to do that both you and peter kind of touched on this idea of being persistent without being annoying um and peter talked about how many people want this idea of mentorship and you, you actually hit on it too max that many people want the idea of oh i'm going to have this gandalf in my life who's going to somehow <laughs> give me the 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 magic you know Keys. broomstick yeah that's gonna you know yeah, crossing crossing stories um but that that idea that we want to look for someone outside of ourselves as you were talking about with the blacksmith mm -hmm. um how do you how do you reconcile working in a big team, but then also taking extreme ownership of of your project and your part in that? Who are you asking? Uh, that's for for anyone who wants it. Yeah, that's what was the question again? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Not for us. <laughs> how do you take ownership of yeah, the property of of your specific part within it, and, and not rely part. on on other people for it? I think. A big part of that comes from when you're working on a project, the worst piece of work speaks for the entire team, and so does the best one. 
And so part of your responsibility of being on a team is to do the best you can every day, uh, especially working, when you're working on a big game or a big film. If you're the worst work, it drags down the whole team. And so I think you can still have that extreme ownership and that uh, pride in your own personal work, and that can simultaneously be uh, a love for the team and uh, something to contribute to something larger than yeah. yourself. Well, I think the team also shows you your strengths and weaknesses too. And as you then see them, you take ownership in that part of what you can offer as a strength, and you then exponentially increase that. Mm. There are some things that you have to not necessarily rely on for people, but you can help, you can have them together in a team and group to be able to obviously finish the product. So the things that you can be aware of and your weaknesses then depend on the people that know that they're stronger in those aspects because I learned those lessons early on at Art Center where we do group team projects and everyone would come together, all strangers, and we start to find out, hey, you know, what do you want to focus on and how do you want to develop this and what do you think you want to work on here too? And we think, well, I want to work on character and you realize, well, I'm not as good as that guy, <laughs> but I can do this really well, I figured it out. And okay, I'm going to let you, I'm going to compromise that you take that lead but I'm gonna really strengthen this part of it because it's not about the individual then, it's about the old group. Mm. It's about the product mm. you're making. And as we come together and we gel, then we all excel from there, right? I think like also that. being proactive on projects is something to be aware of. Uh, even when I went to, Armand invited us to Manila for a talk and some of the students that came to dinner with us mm. were like, he was in an internship and he was like, oh, they kind of just don't really give me anything interesting to do. and and it came down to, I was like, well, why don't you just do that? Like when you go home, they're kind of giving you work because they don't really trust that you can provide something that you know you can do. So I was like, why don't you just go home, do the thing they don't see in your portfolio and bring it in the next day and just put it on your desk. And so when they ask you to do like this little prop and they're like, oh, who did this environment? And you're like, oh, that I just did it on <laughs> yes. my weekend, you know? Like, I didn't know you could even do that. But why don't, we'll have you do this thing. and. I've had that so many times in my career where um, they just, I was like, oh, could I do some creatures on The Hobbit? They're like, ah, I don't know if you can really do that. So I spent that weekend learning ZBrush, just teaching myself ZBrush. And on Monday, I was like, oh, hey, here's this sculpture I did that was as good or better than what was being done on the project. And they're like, oh my God, I didn't know you could do that. Do you want to do the wolves on The Hobbit? I was like, uh huh. <laughs> <laughs> what, what if, but again, they, you, they can't see what's not there right. so it's just you having to put in the extra effort in your own time and just politely just like, oh hey Chip, here's something i uh, worked on it's such you know. an important distinction i feel like we all think we can do everything and until you can prove it you yeah. can't be hired for it yeah. but then the moment that you spend your after hours doing it then all of a sudden you can get in the game or whatever game you choose and it feels like now like the reaction would be most people just get mad and complain, uh -huh. but it's just, it's really the opposite. It's just like, oh yeah, of course, I don't have that in my portfolio. So let me just spend a couple hours or a weekend and look, I, I can. I think you what know? you just touched on is, is one of the single biggest factors between success and failure is did you take ownership of it or did you complain that someone else didn't get you what you needed? Yeah, or didn't give you the opportunity that it's, it's always us. We have to take it upon ourselves to do do that. Mm -hmm. Max, you talked about being part of something bigger than yourself. Um, what, does that, what does that mean to you and why is that important in your life? Hmm. I feel like you're a lot more qualified to answer this one, thanks. <laughs> what does that mean to you and why is that important? You can't do that. You can't do that. <laughs> I'm holding the moderator stick. Um, well, I will say uh, <laughs> I've learned a lot about it with Kip Ash. Um, Kipesh is just this amazing amalgamation of so many different personalities. Like, if you guys have ever seen any of the Kipesh videos, our editor is from Belarus and was a nightclub DJ over there and just got married at Burning Man last week. And he's like <laughs> quite the character. Uh, and so like all of a sudden when he joined our team, all of our videos started having this like electronic hip hop vibe. I was like, I don't know what this is, but it's kind of cool. Like, let's go with it. Uh, or Chris, who's sitting right over there, is our head of marketing. And he's an amazing writer, and he's absolutely hilarious, and probably the funniest person on the team. Just don't let him hear that. Oh. Um, I've heard it. <laughs> uh, but he adds this sense of humor to like our emails and social media, and all of a sudden, this like super serious-looking company is like funny and has these weird hints whenever we release a new kit. 
And, uh, and I think there's all these different parts of this brand that I, I could have never thought up. I could have never been like, oh, let's do funny emails, DJ, Belarusian hip hop music with like this kind of, you know, it, it would have never, we could have never planned it. Um, and I think that's really, for me, what I love about this idea of being a part of something bigger than yourself is that brand and what that company is and what that community is, is so much bigger than me or anything I could have ever created. Uh, it's the team that came together and all shared a little bit of, of themselves into it. And it creates something really unique and something really special that takes on a life of its own. I want to open up for questions for you all in just a second. Um, but tonight, there will inevitably be things that everyone will get to go do with this community. Um, have you guys ever experienced uh, the feeling of being shy at a, at a social event and not wanting to put yourself out there? No. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and, well, and, and, and how do you overcome that? What's that like? Of me. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. I mean, I used to be a very shy person, and now I just tell people I used to be very shy, and nobody believes me. <laughs> <laughs> I think, especially that you just have to force yourself. If you like, I heard something saying uh, a saying. It's like if you act a certain way, and if you continuously act that way, you're gonna eventually become that. Mm. So I think at the very beginning, I was very shy, but I forced myself to always say hi to people. And eventually the shyness just got away because I keep saying hi to everybody and I'm just like, okay, I'm starting to become shameless. This is great. <laughs> 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 yeah, so eventually I, I guess I become a open person, a very active person, and I just, I don't feel shy anymore. So hmm. I guess that's partially the, I guess that's how I overcome it. Yeah. Boom. So put, put yourself out there. A lot of it is just being, like with anything, like when we start drawing, we don't know how to draw. And it's like, if you just sit there and say, oh, well, you know, I don't really know how to do that. I'm never gonna. But if you sit there and you draw every day for a year or however long, yeah. you're going to get better and Practice. you'll be good at it. No, um, I mean, I can add to that a little bit. I mean, right now, as an advice, at this very show, if you wanted to get out there and overcome your shyness, I know obviously some of you guys are in groups of friends, but a couple of you might be just by yourself right now. Some of you might even be from a different country. So things like language barriers I know can be a little bit difficult, but here's the common thing. Everyone potentially has a sketchbook, okay? The sketchbook is the gel that can help you pass those barriers. If you're sitting there trying to talk to somebody, you don't know what to say, but if you see a group drawing together, hey, can I join you and sketch on stuff? Are they gonna say no? Most likely not. And that sketchbook is a great opportunity to continue to share more work and introduce yourself. Some of you guys might be, you know, like to drink or have something else. Again, I just brought beers. I wanted to share one with Ben. Um, so if you find a pro, you're like, man, I don't know how to talk to this guy. Well, I can maybe use a sketchbook. You know what? Just treat them as people. You know, just introduce yourself. Tell them your name. Hey, I love what you did at the uh, show. Can I buy you a drink? And it's like, hey, I'm just drawing and sketching. Can you look at my sketchbook? Not a portfolio, but I'm just drawing. What do you think of my drawings, right? So make it very casual that way. But uh, use that as a way to kind of overcome that moment. The common thing is that everyone here is at least sketching and drawing something. Yeah, yeah I also, in line with that too, I always encourage students. I mean, for me, I, I don't think, I think I grew up not, not that shy. Um, so, I, I mean, I'm, 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 I'm not ashamed to say that. I mean, I'm always, I mean, when I was a kid, I'm always out there. I'm always talking to people. So I think it, it was my personality just to, not loud or anything, but just to be open. But when I take, tell my, my students that it's, it's a need in the studio. I have seen artists, I mean, art, art is so you. You know, we, we tend to be on our own. The, the work that you're doing, even though, yeah, I don't have ownership, this, you know, the studio owns this, but you have ownership. You don't want other people to touch your artwork. But, but the tendency for artists is to be on your own world, you'll be on your own room, you'd rather be in your room and not to entertain your, your cousins, you know, outside. You just want to be there because that's you. That's your personality. And most of artists are like that. I was a little bit like that when I was a kid. But for the most part, we tend to be ourselves. So a lot of my students, are, they have a tough time coming out of that shyness. So yeah, I mean, all the things that they mentioned, those are steps for us to go. But if I could encourage you, it's gonna be a need in the studio if that encourages you more. 
when you go out in the studio to be a concept designer, you have no choice. You have to pitch your drawing. You have to tell your drawing. You have to, you have to what if John Favreau comes in? I, have to, I had that one time. Then I had to show it to John Favreau. We were in the set of Iron Man, and I have, he was directing one of our shows at Sony. And he said, come on down to the studio. You guys would dance. Like, sure. I got nervous for one of the first times I got nervous because, because he's famous. But yeah, thinking that he's also human. He's also human. <laughs> so when I got there, I got to get out of the shell. But this is the one that I teach my students. But the, that's, that, those things happen in front of studio executives. That, that is a job of a concept designer. So my encouragement for you is that's a job description. You don't have to be the loudest. You don't have to pretend to be somebody else. Just, just learn how to express yourself and explain what you did. And that's all that it takes for you to get out of your shell out. So. The last thing I just want to add to that, if you're not comfortable with other people, and this is a lot easier said than done, everyone on this panel is clearly a, a very charismatic social person. Um, I've, I've gotten to talk with these, all of these people outside of this, and they're so welcoming and so warm and super comfortable around people, but as artists, so much of this time is spent introverted. And if you're uncomfortable with other people, I think if you want to get better at that, the biggest thing you can do is get more comfortable with who you are, and get comfortable with yourself. You know, accept yourself, love yourself, be okay with who you are. And if you're okay and comfortable with who you are, you're going to be a lot, you know, in a better place to be able to present yourself to someone else, to feel like you're worthy of that friendship and willing and open to receive them as who they are. If, if I can add a couple tips too, um, we did the Peter exercise of introduce yourself and meet someone next to you and almost nobody remembered the person's name sitting next to them. And I think it's, it's one of the harder things that we do socially um, is we meet hundreds of people all the time. But to any person, their name is so important. And if you let them know that you care enough to remember their name, you let them know that you care about them. And if you, if you can do that and you can open yourself up to be willing to, to put your attention on them when you introduce yourself and really listen to what they say when they say their name, then you can begin to build a bridge. And, if you know someone's name, you can ask them any question in the whole world. If you don't know their name, you can't even ask them to turn around. So if you can find that within you, and here's a trick for it, when they say it, say it back to them. And then repeat it in your head. And if you're in a group of people while, while the group's talking, be like Armand and Peter and shit, what's his name? And then wait, <laughs> wait for it, wait for it. You know? And then if you forget the person's name, ask them again. Say, hey, I'm so sorry. I, I want to know your name, and I forgot it. And he'll be like, it's Ben. And you'll be like, Ben, awesome, <laughs> got it. And if you, if you can hold on to that and you can take that, then ask the person something about themselves. Don't just wait for your turn to talk. When you talk, you're just repeating things that you already know. But when you're hearing someone else's goals, someone else's dreams, and you encourage them to share that with you, you begin to understand what they want. And if you understand what that person wants, then you can bring value to their life. And this is how life works. You get what you put in. So the more value you bring and the more you can connect with someone else's goals, the more value you will get out of your life. And this whole thing, as everyone has said on this panel, is about what happens comes, comes back around. Cheers. Cheers. Let's get Cheers. some questions. Um, Please stand up, say your name, and ask your question. <laughs> Hi, everyone. My name is Tom. Uh, my question Sorry, what's your name? Tom. My name is Tom. You, Tom. Guys, yeah. you guys are going to be Tom tested is. on this. Yeah. Oh, you, you, yeah, should we go? Hi, Tom. Hi, Tom. <laughs> um, I know Peter personally. I mean, I took his class before, and he's an awesome teacher, and I've bumped into Armin, but I want to just gauge their opinion on, like, getting feedback from like students and stuff. Like if they just shoot over work, just to branch off from like the portfolio question, I was wondering how do you guys, how, how would you address that? Like from just a random artist who wants feedback? Uh, go ahead. Yeah. If, if it's someone I don't know or if it's someone I do know? Oh, if it's someone that you don't know. I don't know. Um, and I'll be very frank and honest with you. There's a lot of people that reach out and sometimes I will see the email, and what can also happen is that I look at another email and I had forgotten about the one previously. So there are things that I just don't get to respond to, not because I don't want to, but because, man, I gotta handle all this other stuff, 
And then priority sets in. I mean, I gotta handle my projects over here. I gotta travel over this location. And again, I'm not gonna lie to you in the fact that sometimes I have to just skip it over. Mm -hmm. That's just the way it is, right? And I don't want to gloss over the fact that all of these artists that are out there as pros and as they come up and you trade a network or business card or whatever the case is and you'll say, can I send you an email and can I get a portfolio review whenever you have time? In their, in their explanation, they'll be like, yeah, you know, if I have a moment, I want to reach out to you and I'll, you know, I'll give you a few words. But you're not going to hear from them. It's just the way it is sometimes because they're that busy. Uh, and again, that doesn't mean they're the bad people. It's just, again, they're connecting to a higher, you know, uh, number of amount of people that you might be connecting with yourself. But take the opportunity of the moment in the person, right? Right here, right now. Um, and those are times when you can actually see them face to face, like Banks was saying, they're gonna wanna invest in you. Now, of course, I can come back around and look at some of those emails like, oh shoot, I completely forgot to reach out to this person. I should send out a quick one real quickly if I can. But at the same time, I have to also accept the fact that I can't reach and help everyone either. And I have to just go back to my priorities. So do I feel bad about that? Not necessarily, it's just the nature of how things work. And of course, I might see them in the future at another show. It's like, hey, I sent you an email, but I didn't get a response from you. I'd be like, oh shoot, I'm so sorry. I'm th I wish I could have responded in a timely manner, but let me look at that right now for you, right? So take advantage of the moment and not wait for something, essentially. Yeah, in line with that, I think that's why you have to ask first. You know, don't just send randomly your portfolio to someone. Uh, ask them first, can I send my portfolio? And you can follow up too. I mean, you're allowed to follow up as long as it's respectful. Um, yeah, because it happens to me a lot too. And not because I don't want to. I just put boundaries on my end too because of my priorities, my family, my time with my family. So, uh, uh, Reviewing somebody else's portfolio, probably if I have a 10 priority, that would be a number 10. That's the reality That's of the reality. Yeah. We found that all the time too, producing projects, that people are always reaching out and saying, hey, check out my work and, and I'm ready and I'm available. And when you're in production, you don't really have time to, to review everything. But then three months go by and that person hits you up again and you're like, oh shit, sorry, I forgot, and, um, but we're still too busy, right? And then six months later, they hit you up again and you're like, Damn, sorry, we're right in the middle of production, can't do it. But then when you think about, hey, there's someone in that job title that we do need, because they've reached out to you three or four times, they're on the top of your mind, you think about them again, you're like, oh shit, I know exactly who to call. So I think, I think put yourself Especially out there. Especially that persistence yeah. thing too. That's true, yeah. Um, you shouldn't not do that. You should send those emails out. You should be persistent, but you might not get a response all the time. Yeah. I mean, Max, you talked about, I've heard you say this many times, that you went through the, when you were trying to get your first job, you went through the phone book. It called every studio in town, and it took all the way to Z, to Zoic, to get your first job. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's far for the course. Don't, don't, be, don't be disheartened by rejection. You need one to win. I got 200 of them in a day. It's about how quickly can you get those reps. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's with the, like with anything, like, uh, what was it? The Harry Potter, J.K. Rowling. She got rejected by like 300 publishers for right. Harry Potter. For Harry Potter. Hi, I'm Jessica. So, I, Hi. Well, I'm Jessica. Hi, Jessica. <laughs> so earlier at the beginning, you mentioned that we should be talking to the people next to us, people we're in school with and things like that. But do you think when you're approaching somebody who like might be your idol or somebody you really admire, or somebody that's like out of out of your league, so to speak, hmm. how would you like go about approaching that? Somebody who's like really far ahead of you and that like novice approaching somebody is it just like they're not going to talk to you or is there a better way to go about bridging that gap if they don't talk to you you shouldn't be idolizing them <laughs> <That's> <laughs> you're an asshole. i also feel like <laughs> uh it's so funny because there's still artists that i see that i run into that i'm like Ooh, like, I don't know, I'm not worthy. Like, I don't want to talk to this person. Uh, it's so funny that that never goes away. Um, but <laughs> but that's, uh, that's something that, you know, I think at a certain point you realize like, hey, that's a human being. Art is one part of their life. I'm sure they have a lot of parts of their life. They have a passion that I share. Um, I think going about it like, oh my God, you know, you're an idol. Like that is gonna not get the response you want. Um, but you know, being like, I love your work. How's your day going? Like try to, if you can talk to them and relate to them with the shared passion that you both clearly have, um, you know, a relationship can start. And if 
they act like a diva, then you shouldn't idolize <laughs> them. And also you can like their work and not them as a person. That's okay too. But um, when you do that, that's your chance to see if you like their work and who they are as a person. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Maybe also having like, um, if you have like specific questions or things you want to talk about, like being like, how, how do you think about this or that instead of maybe keeping it kind of general is good. Like um, also like, like you said, treating people like human being, treating people like people, yeah. Um, all the directors I've worked with, I never, I like their work, but I never, I never put anyone on a pedestal. So I'm just like, oh, hey man, how's it going? And I work with them and I do my job and I treat them exactly how I treat anyone else. And I think they like that because they feel comfortable. They're not, I'm not putting them on a higher pedestal or anything. And they're just like, oh, hey Ben, how's everything going? Let's do this. And I don't try to be like, oh my God, thank you. <laughs> kind of and, and it works both ways, right? Like if someone's a student and just coming out of school and, yeah. and coming up to you, you can't put them lower on a pedestal exactly either. Exactly, that too. You yeah, know, that's exactly. another human being who has skills and family and friends and, it, you know, all these different things that make up a person and your years of experience is completely irrelevant in the value of a human being. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I love this question, Jessica, because I think it's something that, that we all go through. I, I, I'm not like Ben, I do put people on pedestals. I think, you know, there's, there's people that I do whose work that I love that make me nervous to talk to. But I think that the people genuinely appreciate genuine appreciation. And that if you really do yeah. like their work and you go tell them why, no one doesn't like hearing that. And if you can go figure out who they are and what's important to them, I think the constant thing we're, we see all the time is people are, are reaching out to us either in person or over email and telling us all about themselves and, and all the reasons that I should like them. Which, which you know, I mean, if, if you're like Peter Hahn, fuck yeah, cool, you're, you're the jam. Tell me all about it, <laughs> you know, but, but I find that what, what really sticks for me when I do that is when I go think about the other person and I go think, what do they want and what's happening for them in their life and what are their goals and how can I help them do that? Or how can I talk to them about it? Because everyone wants to talk to you about the things they're interested in. And if you are interested in them, you're an interesting person, I think. We had uh, one, two, th or two, three, here, <laughs> four, five. <laughs> uh, hi there, my name is Ven. Ven. Hi. So I'm a game designer by trade. <clears throat> and we talked a lot about mutual interests in bringing about easy ways to form connections. So my question is, I'm, I feel a little bit like a duck out of water here. I work with a lot of artists, but I'm not an artist. So when you're dealing with that, someone who's in an adjacent field or a creative, but not your type of creative, how do you go about starting those connections when you don't have the same middle ground. Hmm. It could be a way of like going to an event like this where maybe you don't know anything about art. This is your way of learning things. So when you do communicate with them, you have an understanding of how they think and how they go about doing things. Like if I was working with programmers or something, I would maybe do what you're doing, go to like a programming thing and I can understand, oh, this is how they structure their thoughts or this is how they structure the engine they're working on. And I have a better connection point, just talk to them about things. Whereas, for example, me now, I, I, I don't have very much understanding of that. So I, it's hard for me to have a common ground with some of them sometimes at the office. But I should do what you're doing, where you're looking at these things and trying to understand, like, oh, this is how they create concept art for our game. Maybe I can have a better chance of, I have the vocabulary now to speak to them about, what if we did this instead of that? Whereas before, maybe you didn't. Um, instead of just saying, I don't know, I don't like it, uh, do something else. You have a better way of communicating where you want the game to go or, or something along those lines. I think for me is that you took the effort to come here. Yeah. You're yeah, here right great. now. You stepped outside your door of your comfort zone to come and find out and learn and also connect. And even if you don't have that same technical connection of art, you don't do art, but you can still appreciate it. You can still have common ground in terms of the interests of like the stories and the movies and the comics and the animations that you also watch. And then these people that might create those things, but still can appreciate you that who enjoys those stories, still works in a production of some type in some way, right? So that interest is still there. But again, like I said, you're here right now asking a question. That first step is the most important thing. 
Hi, I'm Nicole, and Hi, I just Nicole. Hi, Nicole. Nicole. Hi, Nicole. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to thank you guys for being here, and it's really, really inspiring to see all these people come together and being passionate about one thing. Um, I'm in high school right now, and I'm really interested in animation, and I moved to California for opportunities for animation. And there isn't a lot for high school students in terms of mentorship and like programs, because everyone's like, we want a college student. Mm. Sorry, five years experience. And I'm like, oh, that's not, <laughs> that's not me. Do you have any um, tips or like places to meet people and talk about art and animation? Because that would be the coolest thing. Probably like brainstorm and concept design oh, academy. So much here. So many. <laughs> yeah, you're at a great place yeah. to do that. Yeah. Right in the middle of it. Yeah. But it's it's just like an atelier style school. You can pick the classes you want, and each teacher is a working professional. So you're you can take classes with the guy who's working on the animated movie you want to work on, and you can impress them and do a good job in their class oh, and cool. build a what relationship. What is it called again? One is called Brainstorm, and the other one is called Concept Design Academy. Uh, both are in Pasadena, and one's Pasadena and Burbank, and I think there's another Brainstorm in Rancho. In Rancho Cucamonga. Rancho Cucamonga. Yeah. Yeah. That's why and a booth. The, the Concept Design Academy and Brainstorm both have booths, and I think those would be a great place to learn and learn from people who are doing the job you want. Yeah. And if you're just starting now in high school, you're you're going to learn so much being in LA. Yeah. I also recommend a place. It's a bit further south. It's a bit far, but there is more of a preparatory school for people that are in high school. Again, places like Brainstorm and CDA might be again a little bit intimidating. You see the work, and like even at a basic level, it's like, oh my god, I can't really do this right now. There's a place in Irvine, California called Kazone, K-A-Z-O-N-E. And it's run by Lim Her, who runs the Superani crew. So they actually train high school students, actually. And so they can train you to actually even consider things like universities or other schools like CDA and Brainstorm to get to that level. Because even their basic might be like, I don't know if I can actually do that right now. Consider those places. That's awesome. Thank you so much. All right. Hi, um, my name is Mars. Hey, Hi, Hi, Mars. So um, I recently got a job in illustration um, right out of high school because I was really oh, lucky awesome. to um, have access to good networking. And so I was wondering if you have any advice for newbies who, once they've networked successfully, um, how to handle your first job and your new experiences with that and also how to handle the um, imposter syndrome <laughs> that comes with uh, like getting your first art job. <laughs> well, you got the job, so <laughs> you got it. There's so no imposter. you're done, right? Yeah. You're done. Not an imposter you're anymore. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was about to what is the imposter the syndrome? There's nothing. Um, no, for me, I have a, I have a student. I, I taught at Biola uh, University for two years uh, in the cinema media arts program. And um, uh, I taught animation. Uh, it, it's an elective that they had before. And one of my students, she's, she's a film student, and she said, oh my gosh, I want to be in animation now. And I said, oh, great, what did I do here? Now she, she, They spent so much time in film, and now she wants to shift in animation. And I was looking at her drawing, and it was okay. I mean, it wasn't that great at the time. So I'm trying to think now, should I discourage her, or should I just, you know. So, I, But I said, just do what, what do you think would be great for you. She wanted to go to Pixar. That's her dream job is Pixar. <laughs> Everybody wants to go to Pixar, right? <laughs> so she tried her best. And I, then I saw her. I mean, we, we stay connected on Facebook. And she got a job at Pixar at the retail department as the store <laughs> manager. I mean, in the, I, I don't know if you've been to Pixar. They have their own store at their lobby. So you can buy you know, Pixar products. So she ran the store, so she ended up in Pixar, so she was so happy. That's her, the sidestep that you were mentioning earlier, you know, whatever it takes for you to get in. And she, she was so pleasant. She's doing, and I think once you get in, a, a lot of people complain, you know, I didn't get my job, or this is too hard. It's always, I think for me as, a, as a, the older person, as a dad, you always, I always have the mentality, it's like, you know, uh, work it out. You know, do, do the best that you can. The, the, the best that you could in the job that you have right now. What are you going to do with the thing that has given to you? So she did her, her job really well. She always contacted me. Who are your friends? I want to be friends with them. So I gave them, you know, I gave her name. So she got connected with them. So she really wanted to, she pursued, she persevered inside persistence. 
uh, without being annoying. But she, she grew, I know, I've been following her. And before you know, and she wants to be a storyboard artist. That's what she wants. She wants to be a storyteller. They had an opening one time. After two years of being the, one, the store clerk, they got a, a job opening um, for, inter I think, for internship or trainee for storyboard artists. So, I mean, the first people that you're going to hire in, in every major studio are the people who you know, love your own. So if you're inside, people know you, there's a relationship, people trust you. I would want to train someone that I know already. So when she applied and they know that she's persistent, she's been doing, she's been sacrificing, I said, come on. And it's, almo it's almost like it's natural way to get in. So now she got in. So now she's not the store clerk, she's a trainee in storyboard. And what would you do if you're the trainee? Be the best at it. Uh, suck in as much as you want, as, uh, as much information as you could. Learn from the people who have been working in the industry. I always ask people, people would always ask me, how should I, how, what should I do, you know, before I could send my portfolio? Look for the person. If you, wanna, if you want Ben Mauro's job, then go find his work online and that's your standard because you want his job. Now, if your portfolio is as good as his, drawings, then that's the time you send your portfolio. Mm -hmm. So it's all about persistence and being good at what you do, you know. So, so it's all about, it's all up to you guys. Okay. If you want the job real well, you will sacrifice. In your position right now for you, I would say just meet your deadlines. Get to know that pipeline really well. Communicate with them too. They already hired you for the skill that you proved that you can do. So just now meet it and get it done. Yeah. And over deliver. Yeah. <laughs> Always. I have a short question. Sorry, say your name, please, sir. Uh, Spiri Don, try that. Hi, Spiri. Hello, Spiri. Yeah, I've heard worse. So, um, Armand is someone I respect endlessly oh, because uh, he's actually doing the extra effort of bringing people together and do the networking. Um, what I would like to know is, um, I mean, aside from that I know why you started the event, mm -hmm. what made you think that you can be that person doing especially that, bringing all them together, giving them the chance to network, um, to have chances, and at the same time help so many people who are in need. Oh, um, Spiridon, I can always pronounce that name. It's Spiridon. Spider that is iron. <laughs> I don't know. If you do it in the American way, just say Spiridon. I'm not American. <laughs> then, 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 then try a Spiridon. A spiridon, that's how I would say it in Tagalog. Spiridon. No, uh, what was the question? Oh, oh I can. <laughs> Sorry, it's my senior moment. No, um, I, we have the, what Spiridon was saying was this icon Manila. We, we have an event similar to this one. That's big, but we have an event in Manila. Uh, every, every year it's called Icon Manila. It's on its sixth year uh, right now. And we bring five uh, top-notch artists in the business and we bring them in Manila. We have Kim Junji, we have Ben Mauro, and these guys on the table here would, would be one of our speakers one of these days. But the, how it, your, your question is how we were able to, no. to, to bring that. What made you, what what made you feel like you have oh, to do ours. this? Oh, I would yeah. like to personally just know. like. Yeah, so there was a big, I don't know if you guys know, but there was a huge, massive typhoon that hit my country uh, like six, seven years ago. And, and I'm here. I was actually, we were in a rap party for Frozen. I didn't go because we were so devastated. It's like, what's going on there? So my wife and I, we were thinking, it, it's always like, if you realize oh, Red Cross would be there, you know, there's a lot of humanitarian services would be there, but, but me as an artist, what, what, what am I doing? I'm here just enjoying my, my, my career here, but here a lot of people that we know are suffering. I think there's a need, if there's a need, and, and find always a way, I think it's an attitude thing. I'm not putting ourselves up or anything, but it's always an attitude that if there's a problem, whether it's in production, how can I help? To, to fix it. You know, even a small help would do. There's always something that has. So my, actually, my wife was the one who came up with the idea, said, because we were thinking, how can I use my talent to help the people in need? We can sell artworks. It's not really going to matter so much. 
we attended one convention in Manila, uh, an artist convention, and we got there and there's 3,000 people. I felt like a rock star in front of these guys. And, and my wife was computing, she's so good with math. And she said, oh, they paid this amount of money and this is the only thing that they paid you guys? They made this much money. And, and then it dawned on us, we can do the, exactly the same. We can do even better than this because we can bring the top-notch artists from the US and bring it here in Manila. And all proceeds, we bring them back to those in need. But I don't want to give them money to just Red Cross or I'm not, I don't, it's not that I don't trust them. I just, I want to see the last penny that we work hard for to, to be brought back to the people in need. So I brought a second team with us. We organized a second team. Um, uh, the, you know, medical mission stuff, we brought them to Manila. So all the money that we got from the conference, we, the second team came, we went actually on land. We, we went to the devastated areas. We look at how many houses. We, on the first year, we were, we were able to help three homes. Man, it's not much, but three families benefited from that. So at least we know the last cent, it went to, that, to those three houses. So it built up and built up and built up. Now in our sixth year, we expanded to uh, shelters. Uh, we're actually supporting now the new one that we're supporting is the human trafficking, anti-human trafficking uh, organization, not human trafficking, the anti-human trafficking organizations. And, uh, and, and, and the cool thing about this organization is they're reaching out to places that we, can, we don't really need to know. So we're giving, in, in a way, we're giving opportunities now to the artists, you guys, to be part of this. You're helping, by helping us, we want to make sure that you're helping those people in need. But I gave it to my wife that she's the one who actually, you know, made that decision that this is something that we could do. We can make a, there's always a need in the world. But at least if we can make that small dent and help a few people, that makes all the difference. So that's all we do. Thank you. All right, we are so close to out of time, but we had two more, and I want to make sure we get them. Sorry. No, you got it. Uh, hi, I'm Joe. Hey, hi. Joe. Hi, Joe. Um, What's up? See, I, I make a webcomic called Ninja and Pirate, which as you can imagine is a very solitary project. I network on Twitter where I can take the time to compose any words and reply and be as witty as possible. But when I meet people in real life, I have legitimate panic attacks because my social skills are beyond lacking. So how do I keep myself from panicking in real life when talking to new people, when, especially when networking with uh, potential business partners? I mean, how can I be likable in real life as I am in this digital mask that I have on that, that persona. Well, I think you should really reflect on what Banks finished with, you know, looking inwardly at yourself. It does start there very much. And it's not just about the business, it's not about just what you're creating, it starts at the self point, and from there it exudes, and you're able to connect and see that reflection in other people too. And you respect you, you respect others. And then the work is in a part of that. It, it, again, it continues from there as a natural conversation, but it can't start with that business conversation. It has to start from the human connection first. But it takes time, and be patient with it. You're not looking for an overnight success either. But you being here and asking that question, as I stated to other people, is that activity you gotta keep engaging with. Uh, so keep looking for these kinds of events as much as possible. They can be small as a gallery show or big events like this at Lifebox, but be, as Ben said, be very proactive in that, right? And, and be interested in someone else. Yeah. Like, be curious to get to know who they are, right? This, your shell is one thing, but if you can put that aside to learn something about someone else, if you want someone to be interested in you, it starts with you being interested in them. And this comes from reps, like practice, make friends here, go introduce yourself, fight through that discomfort. And if you fight through that discomfort, you'll grow. It, it couldn't be more about practice. And I think that almost everyone feels nervous and hardly do we know, you know, and you'll, you'll think, oh man, everyone's looking at me and I feel so strange, but it's, it's often not the case. But I think there's, there's a couple things you can remind yourself of. And first is to breathe. 
Often when we get nervous, our breath shortens, and then we shut down oxygen. Um, if, you, if you want a little trick I used to use all the time, this part of your finger right here, it's a very strange thing to do, but if you do it, like you get, you get nervous, you get a little overwhelmed, there's a, a pressure point right here. Hold that for 10 seconds, it'll help calm you down. Okay, so when I'm meeting with someone for like yeah, business. On, on the way walk in. Walk in right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Perfect, perfect, exactly, you got it. So you're, you're incredibly likable. Who, we had one more. One wait, more, wait, one wait, more. one more thing on that, yeah. just because I think it's important. Uh, every, everyone on, on in these tables, I'm sure, you, everyone I know has done a lot of talks at this point, and so uh, everyone here is pretty comfortable being on in a panel, on stage, in front of a bunch of eyeballs looking at you. Like when you first do this, it's terrifying. Yep. It's just you're like freeze, like oh, man, is this? Uh, what are they thinking? That that person's looking at me weird. Like, <laughs> and you talk, and you just start. Yeah, what do you do? What do I do with my hands? <laughs> um, it's funny you can you can hear it in, in in your voice when people are on stage for the first time their voice trembles and they get really nervous and it's the same sort of thing when you're meeting someone and you're not comfortable in a social situation and I think here today everyone's able to be so comfortable up here and everyone up here is just sharing themselves and being vulnerable and talking about their ups and downs and completely uh, natural and I think that comes from that same sort of thing of doing a lot of reps and iterations and having fought through that fear of being in front of a bunch of eyeballs enough times to the point where now they're all comfortable with it. Yeah, like the this is maybe our 50th or 100. Like the first time was a mess. Like I was just, it was just, I didn't know what to say. I was like, uh, uh and I just started drawing, you know? I don't know, I, I was just so nervous. I, you know, you're just like, I had something I planned to say, and then you're just like, uh, you know? But after, you know, again and again and again, you get less and less nervous, and you just, you just stop thinking about it. You just don't even care anymore. And but don't run away. <laughs> I also think it's a good idea to just make fun of yourself because once you laugh at yourself, then other people feel more comfortable to, you know, just this person's kind of fun. I guess I don't really, you don't have to just be serious and feel, you don't have to feel super confident about yourself. Even if you are not, and the other person's probably going to make a personal connection with you in any way. As I think just be genuine, just be, just be super genuine, just be a human, just be a normal human, and the other human will understand you. Because we're all just human, you know? No aliens here, right? <laughs> That's probably an alien, yeah. <laughs> such a good point. Laughter makes the world go round. Yeah. You can also, too, own it. Say, hey, I'm a little bit nervous. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. you can just say that. You can just be like, hey, I'm nervous, but are you nervous? Are you nervous too? Maybe you're nervous too, but maybe I'm just making fun of myself, but you know, who cares? At the end of the day, we're all human and we can understand each other. Or like what Peter said about the sketchbook thing, like if you have your comic, maybe like have it printed out and stuff like, oh, hey, here's some of my work and mm -hmm. uh, I'd love to talk to you. And or, or like when you meet someone, I give them a business card. This could be your elaborate business card or something. It's like, oh, here's some of my work. Um, I love what you do. And uh, just see where it goes. So it's it all starting with the art and work you're doing. Awesome. Last question. All right. So this one's kind of like. Sorry, wait. What's, what's your name? name? Oh, sorry. Kirsten. <laughs> My name is Kirsten. Hi, Kirsten. Hi, Kirsten. Hi. Hello. Sorry, could you say that one more time? I missed it. Kirsten. Kirsten. Oh. Hello. Hello. Hello, Kirsten. <laughs> um, so just off the kind of off the topic, but like what are some like the big X no no's that you've seen maybe through your time in the uh, the industry for um, people applying or like artists asking for help, like through like cover letters or in their portfolios or how they approach you What are just like don't do's. Mm. Applying to a job with someone else's work in your portfolio? Oh, no. <laughs> that's, 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 that. that's different. That's All day level. long. It happens every time. Oh, no. <laughs> it, I mean, it's so hard to, uh, to be specific. Yeah, that's a really good one. I think that's the number one. Um, I think it's more that like, for me, it's a mindset. The, the one no-no that I tell my students, or you know, even for me, someone told this to me and I was able to apply it and I, I tell it to my students, that um, do not look at any studio as your destination. If 
only I can get to Disney, I can die. No, don't <laughs> do not do that. You know, you have, I mean, you, have, you can dream. I want to be at Disney. I want to be at Dreamers. I want to be at this point. And that's totally fine. Everything, I, I look at it as a vehicle. Everything that, as long as we have, we're alive, we're in a journey, and Disney would just be a vehicle. Now, if you stay there for a long time, fine. But if you need to leave, then it, it was just one of the vehicles, then you move on. Because a lot of, a lot of artists, they would invest, they would sell their souls to a studio, and I've seen relationships destroyed, I've seen families get separated just because of a studio. And one thing I would say, there's no studio here on earth that's worth destroying your families and your relationships for, nothing. So, so do not look at them as the end goal, these are just vehicles. Keep your word, always. If you say you're gonna do something, do it. If you say you're gonna hit a deadline, never miss a deadline, right? You, that is keeping your word. And I feel like once you break your word, you can't be trusted. Mm -hmm. And that just, that's a, that's a lasting thing, not just for someone else, for yourself. Like that's your power, that's your accountability. Mm -hmm. And so I think the biggest no-no for me, the people that I won't work with anymore are the people who don't keep their word. Um, and the people who I work with all the time are the ones that I know they will keep their word and that they always deliver. They always do what they're going to say they can do. I know I can count on them. And so I think for your reputation, for the longevity of your career, for your own personal power, uh, keep your word. Uh, what I can think of is when someone approach to ask a question, but you can, they can, they show that they absolutely did no research at all before they ask you that question. I'm like, then why do you waste my time to answer this question when you can find maybe a million resources to, uh, to find the answer for this question? If you really need to know that, you should research, you should Google, you should do hmm. any, you, you should, like some questions, there's a whole book about this question on Amazon. And why do you not even research that before you ask someone else about it? I think that's a no-no for me. There's a great website on that called Let Me Google That For You. <laughs> I'm not joking. And you type in whatever their question was, and it sends them an animated GIF of how to type that into Google. <laughs> and then it launches them into the Google search results right afterwards. It's great. But if it, but if it is something like that, it's more like if you like this artist's work, it's, more, it's less about how do I do this thing, but what are your thoughts about how to do this thing? Like if... There's a lot of books about creature design, but Terrell Whitlatch, like how, how do you think about this type of creature design? I would love to be interested in hearing her specific yeah. opinion about something, yeah. but not like a general, yeah. how do you draw a horse, you know, or something yeah, like that. how do you draw a horse? Yeah. There's like a book on Amazon, it's called How to Draw a Horse. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, for me, I would say always update your work constantly. Mm -hmm. I've had students come up to me with portfolios and I ask them, how old is this? And they'll say, oh, three years ago, two years ago, get it out. It doesn't represent you anymore. Can you do this better now? Oh, yeah, I think I could. Then what is it here for? Right? Why are you showing it to me? So always update the work constantly. Make the effort to create new content every time. Ladies and gentlemen, this has been so much fun. I want to send a huge thank you to Bobby Chu at Lightbox for putting together this amazing event. Um, also to Spiritin from Firestarter. Um, Armand Serrano, Peter Hahn, Ben Morrow, Ken Lee, Max Berman.